Thank you. Thank you very much. Dobry den Praha. Dobry den. I got a bigger reaction in Bratislava. Thank you. Do I have the uh, clicker? Ah, here it is. Um, thank you. I want to talk about something that I have a lot of passion about. When you see that red light start blinking, somebody wave at me because I can go on for a long time about leadership. I love it. I work with people all over the world. And I want to tell you about something that I discovered not long ago. First of all, a little history. This is the Rosetta Stone. Uh, many of you have heard of this, and basically uh, what it is is a piece of rock, basalt, that was found in El Rashid, Egypt in 1799 by a young lieutenant in Napoleon's army when he was ransacking the country, going to take everything back to France. And what happened was, this was discovered accidentally. This young lieutenant actually tripped over this thing. But until this, actually three years later, when it was figured out, no one knew how to read hieroglyphics. And you can see the top section is hieroglyphics. But what this was, was hieroglyphics, the same passage in Demotic script, and then ancient Greek. From that moment on, in 1802, when it was deciphered by Campion, it became a metaphor for unlocking a mystery, for that final clue that answered an important question or solved a mystery. And what I want to talk about today is a mystery that I feel, if is not solved, will be much larger in crisis than the financial crisis that we just came through. I think it will dwarf it by comparison. So, what is the mystery? Well, we know that we are in the twilight of operational improvements that we all worship in the 20th century. TQM, lean manufacturing, all of the things that we learned how to do to make ourselves more efficient, we now find on a global basis are delivering diminishing returns. The Gallup organization, in fact, did a study, and they found that at the same time, what was happening is 80% of the global workforce is either passively or actively disengaged from what they do. Think about that for a second. The global economy, this survey had 2 million participants, and it was global. We are operating the global economy on 20% efficiency. Now, set that fact aside. This is the one that if I were in a boardroom right now, if I were a chairman of a board, this is the one that would scare me. Behavioral economists tell us that the important decisions we make in life, who to marry, what car to buy, where to live, who to vote for, whether or not to be engaged in our jobs, we don't make by logic. We make by emotion. Now, I can't walk in to someone and logically ask them to become engaged in their job. It doesn't work that way. People get engaged through emotion. So, put all these together, and this is science, by the way, it's not my opinion. Put all those together, I would ask as a chairman, okay, if this is true, where is growth going to come from? If it's not coming from these places, where will it come from in the 21st century? Well, let's take a look at where it's not going to come from. What I'm about to show you are actual responses that I got from subordinates who work for leaders that were identified as underperforming leaders. They were identified as leaders who could not get the job done, and I was asked to come in and work with them. 
Now, it's kind of hard to see from there, but let me read a couple of these to you. Number one, well, he's really not as mature as he should be. He could be a little more modest. Ring a bell with anybody? Interpersonal competence. Listen, this is 70% of the issue. The other 30% is just time management. Listen, be there when your team needs you. Connect with them. Look, you don't need to pay a lot of money to have somebody like me come in to talk to you. This is common sense stuff. There is no real feeling of team under this person. Very structured, lives by logic alone. He doesn't take relationships beyond the transactional. This is a person whose interest even seems artificial at times. You know what I mean. In your outlook, you have a reminder that comes up that says, today is Yerji's birthday. So you walk and you say, hi, Yerji, happy birthday. I got to get back to work. Okay, this is my favorite one is the last one. I can never maintain her attention in a conversation. She's constantly playing with her Blackberry, taking important calls or going through papers, preparing for her next meeting. Either what I'm saying is no interest or she's overwhelmed. Neither one of those choices are good, okay? Now, my next slide I have to apologize for. It should be rated PG-13, I guess, because even though I'm going to quote uh, a famous author, there is a profane word in it. I will apologize for it in advance. I will ask you if you will be offended by that. Please avert your eyes and put your hands over your ears. But Professor Robert Sutton at Stanford University wrote a bestseller, The No Asshole Rule. And somebody asked him, why did you name the book this? And he said, you know, in my study, I'm interested in people who are really poor leaders. I want to know why they're so crummy. And he said, as I travel around the world and I'd ask people, well, people that had bad leaders, I'd say, well, tell me about your leader. And they didn't say, well, this guy's not too nice or this woman's not too well, not too easy to work with. They said, she's an asshole. So he said, that's why I named the book The No Asshole Rule. Now, what do we know about assholes? What do we know about bosses that deliver what psychologists call threshold performance? This is the performance that you will do only to keep your job, to get your vacation, to get your insurance, these are the people who pull out of the parking lot at night, and when they hear an explosion behind them, they don't even look back because they don't care. They want to go home. They want to get away from where they work. That's threshold performance. Well, what are these people like? These are the people who are creating the 80% of the workforce that Gallup told us about consistently leaves others demeaned or de-energized, especially those who have less power. Ring a bell with anybody? Somebody that publicly humiliates someone or says, that was, jeez, we've already thought of that idea, forget that. Or calls you into a meeting and you start to say something, they finish the sentence and say, boy, where'd you come up with that idea? Less sensitive to the needs of others. Uh, great story I remember from a friend of mine who worked for a large consulting firm. He was a new consultant and he was going to celebrate. And he had his mother come to meet him at the office because he bought two tickets for the opera that night. And he knew that his mother would really enjoy going to the opera with him. And so he was the last one in the office. It was about seven o'clock and he had the tickets out. His mother, he'd just been told, was waiting in the lobby for him. And just then, the managing partner came by and said, had a big stack of paper, and he said, uh, Honza, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm going to go to the, uh, I'm going to the opera with my mom. He said, really, when? He said, tonight, we're going to go. I got the tickets. He said, oh, that's too bad. He said, why? He said, well, because I got this report here that needs to be translated into English by tomorrow morning. And Honza said, uh, but I've got my mom. I, I, uh, he said, look, what do you want? 
Do you want to impress the partners, or do you want to go to the opera with your mom? Do you want to make a life here, or do you want to live with your mom? You choose. Honza didn't go to the opera that night. He stayed, only to find out the next day that the managing partner already had the report in English. But what he wanted to do was be a hard ass to him. Don't care about the needs of others. More focused on their own needs. Same kind of thing. Uh, hi, somebody tell me you're pregnant. Congratulations. Listen, I'd help you carry that, but I gotta leave and I just got this suit pressed. And by the way, you're gonna have to work tonight. Plan to stay till about nine and we're gonna, we're gonna work this weekend. Okay, see ya, gotta go. I'm having fun today. Disinhibition becomes less inhibited about social norms. This is my favorite. What does this mean? This means the person that's habitually late calls a meeting at 3 o'clock. When do they show up? 3.40 and don't say anything, you know? Oh, I'm important. I don't need to be adhering to any of the social norms. I'm an important guy. Now, What's happening to the assholes of the 21st century? The people that learned how to be leaders in the 20th century. Daniel Goldman, the father of emotional intelligence as we know it today, that wrote the bestseller Emotional Intelligence and Social Intelligence, did a study with his team of psychologists. They interviewed 900 CEOs from around the world that had just been fired. This is what he found out. We worship cognitive intelligence. Somebody's smart, they went to a good school, you got an MBA from a top B school, all right. You got experience that we like, Oof, you know, that's good. Okay, let's hire this guy. Okay, yeah, 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 let's get him in, okay. But what happened is they found out that they were fired because of their lapses of social and emotional intelligence. Four weeks ago, I was asked to meet with the fired CEO of a very large financial institution in Central Europe. It was not in the Czech Republic. And I sat down with the person. I was asked by the chairman to meet with him to find out what was wrong because he felt there was some hope for this guy, but not at their business. So I asked him, why did you get fired? He said, well, well we, didn't, we didn't agree on uh, strategy. Yeah, right. That's what I expect to hear. So I talked to him for another 30 minutes. I said, are you ready to tell me now why you got fired? He said, okay. Got called into the chairman's office in what would have been, what would be the last meeting he would ever have with this chairman. And the chairman said to him, you are the smartest guy we've ever had in this role. You know the market better than anyone we've ever had in this role. You know our weaknesses. You know our strengths better than anyone in the role. And you know how to sell this product and tell people what to do better than anybody we've had in this role. But nobody cares. Nobody wants to be in the same room with you. Nobody wants to talk to you. And sadly now, nobody wants to work with you. You're fired. So, what does the Rosetta Stone for the 21st century look like? This is what it looks like to me. The future for leaders belongs to the people who can crack the code to employee engagement. So let's take a look at what that means. Now, at the Prague Leadership Institute, we call that, this code, the human element of leadership. And this is what the Rosetta Stone in the 21st century looks like. The translation piece is this. It's how you translate these elements to your own personal, authentic, and individual style. Unlike the Rosetta Stone that the young lieutenant tripped over in 1799, this one, the only way you can put it to work is through personal commitment and the choice to become a leader. Leadership is a choice. It is not a birthright. It's not a title on an organizational chart. It is a choice that you make. We become the choices we make in life. 
emotional intelligence, social intelligence, contextual intelligence. This is what I call, it's not the what, it's the how. Contextual intelligence, Socrates talked about it. It is not the fact that you know what to do, but it's with whom, to what degree, with what intensity, when. It's the context. Some people call this a holistic approach, cause and effect. I call this the physics of leadership. What is the effect of what you do? What is the effect of what you think, what you say, what you do on the people around you? This is real leadership. Leaders bring out the best, not only in themselves, but everyone around them. That's a leader. A leader is somebody who has the courage to unlearn the 20th century style of command and control leadership. These are the things that will spell the future for leadership. I'll end with my favorite quote from uh, a 20th century author, Ayn Rand, who wrote The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. What I've just shared with you is fact. Again, it is not my opinion. It is not something I woke up with this morning after eating a grapefruit and thinking, wow, this is a great idea. This is fact. This is reality. And Ayn Rand told us, you can evade reality. But one thing you cannot evade is the consequences of evading reality. And that is what's going to happen to the assholes in the 21st century. Now, I said earlier, we become the choices that we make in life. And when you leave here today, you will begin making those choices. And the choices you make, every choice you make, every hour, every day, will either bring you closer or take you further away from the goal that you have in life, no matter what it is. Remember that. And I hope that you choose to use the Rosetta Stone in the 21st century to uncover your own potential. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.